Hallelujah. Father, we thank you. Father, we bless you. Father, we give you praise. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your care. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you that the entrance of your word this morning will give light and understanding to every one of us. We thank you for illumination. We thank you for fellowship. We thank you for your power. Thank you, Almighty God, that we will know what you are saying. We will understand what you are saying. And Lord, we will believe what you are saying. And our lives will be transformed and changed. Thank you for everything you've done. Lord, we give you praise. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen, amen, amen. Um, I want to welcome you to church today, the 20th day of January. And today I'm going to be preaching part three of the message that I have been preaching for the past few weeks called Reframing Your Mind from Scarcity to Abundance Mindset. Reframing your mind, the mindset from scarcity to abundance. And today I'm going to be talking about, specifically about avoiding the status trap. Avoiding the status trap. Now, in part one, our focus was on gratitude, right? The fact that when you embrace the mindset of gratitude, that gratitude then becomes the great attitude that builds us or that elevates uh, us into a higher realm of altitude. So uh, there's a saying that I normally say that gratitude is the great attitude that leads to a higher altitude. All right. So as we become grateful, we draw great things into our lives. Part two, I spoke about the power of giving. The fact that uh, when you give, there is a right way to give. We must give as we propose in our heart. We must give as God has laid in our heart. We must not give out of compulsion. We must not give because somebody is cajoled us or somebody has threatened us, you know, with <laughs> with um, some repercussions if we don't give. But I said... Givers get because giving creates vacuum that must be filled by a, by nature. God has wired it such that nature has us vacuum. So when we give, it creates a vacuum in our lives that has to be filled up. One of the ways in which we reframe our mindset from scarcity to abundance is through the act of not embracing uh, not chasing status, you know, to avoid the status trap. Now, when we talk about status, what do we mean by status? According to dictionary.com, status is defined as the position. The noun form of it is defined as a position that an individual has in relation to another person. The position that a person has in relation to another or in relation to the other group of people, especially in regard to social or professional standing. Status is also the high social or professional standing, the prestige that somebody has, has above the other. Right? So somebody might be um, in a social in a societal construct, somebody might be a doctor has a higher societal standing than somebody who's probably uh, a gatekeeper, right? By profession, right? Now, there's nothing wrong in aspiring to become a doctor. The key thing is not to allow that status to be what defines your identity. Status becomes a challenge, becomes a trap when it then defines us, when um, it is the source of our happiness and joy in life. The word status can also be an adjective when it, it, it is used to confer or to believe to have been used to confer the elevated status. So you might say the person has a status car, a status job. For example, you might consider somebody who's got a job at the White House, you know, maybe a, a legal practitioner who's got a job at the White House as the person's landed a status job. 
compared to somebody who works in a local farm somewhere somewhere in Idaho. Right. So you see the, the thing is that in our society, status is important. Status plays a role. It sets people in categories, right? It puts people in different buckets. Right. But the challenge of chasing status is that it can become what um is described as will or the wisp you know it's like a, a chasing shadows as it were once you've acquired one level of status you find that somebody who's got a higher level than you and then you pursue that and pursue that and pursue that it becomes a never-ending cycle of pursuance now please hear me out very well there's nothing wrong in achieving your goals there's nothing wrong in you becoming successful if you know me if those of you been following my teaching i'm pro i'm a pro success person i talk about success i talk about the need for you to fulfill your purpose and destiny i believe that we were placed here by god for a reason and i believe that we should succeed right based on the calling and the gift that god has placed upon our lives but those things do not actually not define us as our identity should not define um, you know our joy and our happiness and who we become in life now it is easier said than done so that's why today's message is going to be a bit challenging you know but this is what the lord is working with me and teaching me about now a recent review by university of california berkeley in the university of the united states found that the desire for status is a fundamental human motive which means people seek to receive respect and difference from others they also found evidences that shows that this desire is also competitive in nature people not only desire to be respected they desire to be accorded more respect and more difference than others and that is where the challenge that is present why because it can lead us to what we call a status spiral what is a status spiral? A status spiral is where we compare ourselves with those we perceive as higher status than us. Then we feel insecure and we begin to doubt ourselves and we begin to doubt our self-worth. This in turn leads us to chase more status as a way to try to feel better about ourselves, right? Um, so that way it becomes a circle. You know, you've heard um, the, uh, the 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 popular saying. Uh, you know, um, uh, don't be like the Joneses, right? Which means, um, you know, these it was a, was a, was a popular saying. It's a popular saying that describes a, a couple that moves into uh, an, an upscale environment, and um, they saw their neighbors have kind of cars and kind of you know uh, things that they the kind of top cars and toys that they have in their house and they didn't have that you know but they had to go and what you know borrow and then had to buy this and then they rack up debt upon themselves so that way now they have used this their neighbors as the basis of their self-worth and they're now chasing to be like somebody else now remember that i have often said this that the people that you associate yourself with are important i've said before that if you hang out around people who have no aspiration soon enough you start to feel like there's nothing really for you to fight for in this life so when we're talking about um do not run the race to chase status we are not talking about hanging out with people that don't have any aspiration for life when god created you god created you on this earth for a reason and a purpose and therefore i believe that chasing that purpose is one of the most significant things you can do with your life it's okay what am i what have i been created to do and let that be your laser focus attention to do that but you are not trying to compare yourself or outdo somebody a status, a status spiral occurs when we compare ourselves with people that are, ah, this person is, is done better. I will not have to do all I can to 
to get there. And then by the time you try to get there or overdo somebody, and then it becomes the next level. What's the next level? What's the next level? You know, you just keep chasing status and it becomes a spiral. But you can also chase status on the other way where you compare yourself to those that you perceive are below you on the status ladder and you develop a superiority complex. Why? Because now you feel good about yourself, you feel better than somebody else, and then it leads you to chase what? More status. So as a way to try and maintain the class system. There's nothing wrong with a desire to live a life of significance. It is hardware into our DNA to succeed, to grow, to dominate the earth. God placed that imperative in us to be like that. But it becomes a problem when we now feel inadequate or we feel invisible after we compare ourselves to other people and they erupts us of this atmosphere of abundance that God already had wired into our lives. Now, let me share with you the reason why this chasing status challenge is a problem. And this is something that God has dealt with me too as well over and over. I said, no, don't do that. Don't chase that. You know, focus on this, focus on that. You know, and so don't think uh, this is something that you need to think about one of Something that you just got to check. And what some of the exercises I have today towards the end of the service, if you can just pay attention to that time, will show you how you can begin to know when you start to chase status and what you can do about it. Now, the first status that was chased or the first status chasers in the history of the world were Adam and Eve. And the status they were chasing, you might look at it from the outside as a noble status. They were chasing the God status. What do I mean by that? Well, Adam and Eve were made in the image and likeness of God. So they were already like God. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 27 to 28, the Bible says, God said, let us, as the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, make mankind in our image after our likeness. And let them have complete authority. What did, they, what did he say they should have? Complete authority. Over what? Over the fish of the sea, the birds of the earth, the, the tame beasts, and over all of the earth, and over everything that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. That word man there is mankind. God created mankind in his own image. In the image and likeness of God, he created him or he created them. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, using all of his vast resources in the service of God and man, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves upon the earth. So we see here, God created man or humans in his own image and after his likeness. So already by virtue of the fact that God created them in his own image and likeness, what do they have? They have what? The God status. They have the God status and they are measured to function as gods on this earth. But now notice, when God gave them that, when God made them in his own image and likeness, what is the reason? He said, let them have complete authority. So essentially, the reason why they were created in in the image and likeness of God is so that they can have what? They can have this authority. They can have this authority over the earth. But they cannot have this authority if they don't or they cannot function in this authority that has already been given to them. If they don't have the mindset that what? They are gods on the earth. So, and God said to them, In order for you to demonstrate this authority, there are five things you need to do. There are five assignments. You must be fruitful. You must multiply. You must replenish. You must subdue. And you must have dominion. So, God, therefore, created humans in his own image and after his likeness. Number two, God said to them, because I have created you in my image and likeness, you have authority over everything that I have created. And the way to demonstrate that authority is to be fruitful, to multiply, to replenish, to subdue, and to have dominion. So that is um, the imperative that is wired into their DNA, the ability to rule and dominate over the earth and over everything created. 
But God did not create man to dominate another human being. Everybody created by God was created with this royalty, this royal mindset. The desire to therefore dominate somebody else or to create clubs and societies to put some people in a group is created with because of the mindset of what I am about to talk about now. In the beginning, it was not so. When God created humans, created us, you know, in his own image and likeness, there was no classism. There was no clubs and groups. There was no, uh, you know, we are in this group, we are in that group, you know. There, was, there were no party systems. We were just all made in the image and likeness of God. Everybody is equal. Everybody had the same, they were made the same image and likeness. But something happened along the way to tip the scale in a different direction. They were created with this mindset to act like God, to be like God. So what did God do? God then went to create a garden. The garden is called the garden of Eden. It's called the garden of the light. It's called an enclosure of the light. God created this garden and God placed them in that garden to do what? To demonstrate authority, to enjoy the garden. The atmosphere that God created around Adam and Eve was an atmosphere of luxury, an atmosphere of of abundance. There was no scarcity ever mentioned in the garden of Eden. Scarcity is a learned behavior that came from the fallen nature. But how did the fallen nature happen? The fallen nature occurred because of the desire to chase status, the God status. In Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 to 7, the Bible says, The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, Did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Of course, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. The woman replied, It is only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. God said, You must not eat of it or even touch it, for if you do, you are going to die. Verse 4, the devil said, You won't die. The serpent replied to the woman, God knows that your eyes will be opened and as soon as, soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Verse 6, the woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious and she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Two, at, their, at that moment, their eyes were open and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig, fig leaves together to cover themselves. Now remember, Genesis chapter 1 verse 27. God created it. God, so God, created man in his own image in the image and likeness of god he created him male and female he created them notice that that is what god did they were already like god genesis chapter 3 verse 5 the devil said god knows that your eyes will be opened as you as soon as you eat of this tree right and you'll be like god so now the desire to be like god was sold to them And the Bible said the woman was convinced. What made her to be convinced? What do you think made the woman to be convinced that if she takes of this tree, she takes of the fruit of this tree, she will be like God? The only way for us to be convinced that the statement that the the serpent made was true can only be because she did not believe that she was already like God. There's no other explanation. The only way for, for you to, to, for you, let's say for example, you look in the mirror and you definitely look in the mirror, you say you look like a man. You, are, you have all the, apparel, you know, all the things that a man should have. I'm talking of a physical organ now. And then you go and when somebody say, oh, but you are a woman. Will you not say the person is gone cuckoo for calling you a woman when you know clearly that you're a man. The only way for you to become convinced that you are not a man but you're a woman is if you do not believe in the first place that you're a man. So, the woman was convinced 
because she believed a lie because all either though she had not really believed that she was made in the image and likeness of god she thought if i do x y and z then i will be like god if i do x y and z then i will be like god i will be like god i will be in the god class but she was already in the god class by nature and the reason why i'm laboring this is because a lot of times when we embrace scarcity mindset in the church as believers it comes from the fact that we don't already believe who god has declared us to be god says you are holy and righteous and blameless we say no 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 i'm not holy i'm still a sinner saved by grace you're righteous no 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 i'm not righteous god is just managing me the bible says god has showered mercy on you say no 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 god is just tolerating me every time you don't believe what god has said about you is then you are susceptible automatically to the lies of the devil it is very it's, it's simply that simple and this has nothing to do with your emotions a lot of people would say i don't feel like god is with me you, your feelings has nothing to do with it god says i am with you just believe it if you believe it then you are going to experience it you cannot say unless i feel good before i believe that's not the way faith works darling the way faith works is you need to believe what god said before it can manifest in your life unfortunately this woman was convinced that she was not like god she believed that she had to do something to make her like god and then what happened she followed through now when she followed through she took the food she ate it she gave it to her husband who was with her the husband ought to know better the husband will say oh, no 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 why is a talking serpent talking to my wife but the husband didn't say a word he kept quiet and that's again, again another lesson here is when something is going on in a family and you as the man keeps quiet say, oh i'm just gonna let you go you are allowing trouble in your home and again let's, let's say this, this is a house where the man is not available but the woman is there you are the spiritual head of the house and something is going on with your children and you they say oh i keep quiet i'm not going to talk about it i'm not going to pray about it then you are going to allow the devil to to rough to run to run rough short over your family and now you can't come back and say it's god god what are you doing there? how come you didn't do anything there? god said i gave you the authority why are you not using your authority so they were already made like god they were meant to function like god to rule over everything on the earth including serpent by the way everything on the earth was given to them but the devil succeeded in developing a sense of lack in them which shifted their attention away from the abundance the glory the honor which god already bestowed on them their attention was shifted away from abundance now to scarcity to lack that they don't have enough the desire to be like God, to claim the God status, which they already had, was what led to their fall. They were already like God. Because they did not embrace the mindset and agree that they were already like God, they allowed a new picture, a life from the pit of hell, to be painted in their heart. And what happened? They lost the garden. They lost the garden of the light. And now what happened is they were besotted with a sense of shame and nakedness. Now, excuse me, I have some notes here that is going to be on the screen. I said, every time we shift our attention from the reality of who God has declared us to be, we automatically embrace a mindset of shame, a mindset of nakedness, and of not being good enough. Every time we seek to get validation from the things which God created, in order for us to claim the God status, we automatically embrace the mindset of scarcity and not of being good enough. So if you are here today and you don't feel good enough, it is because somebody, somewhere along the line, someone, someone has told you a lie and that you have believed it. They have told you you are not good enough because you are not tall enough. You are not good enough because you are not fine enough. You're not good enough because of your body weight. You're not good enough because of your IQ. You're not good enough because of your EQ. Let me tell you something. None of those things mentioned define who you are. Tall enough, good enough, better enough. Who came up with these statistics? 
They are statistics that human beings created to put people in the class system. And this, this statistics created the illusion of luck in a world filled with so much abundance. Now, when you think you don't have, based on the yastic that somebody had created and then you have believed and be sucked into it, then what happened? You spend the rest of your life trying to become what you already are. Can you see how difficult this becomes? Can you see how foolish, actually, this art could be? But unfortunately, human beings are emotional beings. A lot of times we make decisions not because it is logical. We make decisions based on emotion, based on what the group is doing. This is the reason why marketers do a lot of wonderful job in creating a sense of lack in us. Unless you drive this type of car, you are not good enough. Unless you live in this type of house, you are not good enough. Please, hear my heart out. I am not against success. I am not against the fact that you need to achieve more and be more and do more and have more because God created this beautiful world for us to enjoy. What I'm saying is you must not tie your identity, your joy, your happiness to the acquisition of these things or because you so much wanted to be in a particular group. Unless you're in a particular group, you don't feel good enough of yourself. If you have bought into that lie, then you have chasing status. It will end up creating a sense of scarcity in you that you will end up losing the garden. The garden of what? The garden of the light. Life becomes painful. Life then lacks the joy that God wants you to have now because you are chasing shadows. What is the one thing that could take our attention from focusing on God and, and who he created us to be to start chasing shadows? Status. Status itself is not bad. It is a problem when we tie our self-worth to status. As long as your happiness in life is not tied to status, then you're fine. Status. What is it? Status is conferred by our words and accolades. Status. What is it? Status is conferred by membership in exclusive clubs. What is status? Status is endorsement by powerful people. What is status? Status is approval by the masses. There, there was a man in the Bible. His name was King Saul. King Saul lost the kingdom. God found David and left King Saul alone because of this last statement, approval by the masses. King Saul was told not to offer sacrifice. Was, he was meant to wait for the prophet of God to come and do it. But King Saul said, when he was waiting for Samuel, Samuel was a prophet to show up. As Samuel didn't show up on time, King Saul put himself in the position of the of the priest and began to sacrifice. And when Saul, Samuel showed up, Samuel said, "What is this thing that you have done? Obedience is better than sacrifice." He said, "It is because of the people. The people were about to leave me, so I had to do something." He has tied his approval to the masses. And God said, this man is not qualified to lead my people. People play status games to gain power and to gain influence within a system of scarcity. I I I want you to write that down. People play status games to gain power and influence within systems of scarcity. And these games of scarcity has been so entrenched in our system, even right from a young age, that we might even struggle to understand what, what is David talking about today? We might even struggle to understand, is this even make any sense? For example, Harvard admission is a status game. Do I want my child to go to Harvard? Yes, possibly. But it's it's still a a status game. Private education could be a status game. Again, just check the motive behind why you are doing it. Check the motive why you are doing it. Celebrity is a total status game. Titles within corporations are status games. Bestseller lists, I've got one. Yeah? It's a status game. Boy, it is, remember what I said, status in itself is not bad. It becomes a problem when you tie your self-worth to it. Now, let me tell you how it can become a problem. Suppose 
you write a best-selling book. And the book sold a million, whatever it is. You feel good about yourself, right? Because, oh man, I'm a bestseller, I'm a bestseller. Right. They, you wrote the next book, it didn't become a bestseller. Then all of a sudden you start to feel, oh man, I failed. I didn't get to become a bestseller, man, I failed. Then at that point in time, what have you done? You have tied your status, your, sorry, your, your identity, your self-worth to being the bestseller. You get, you see the difference. So, seeking to be the best in your field is not a problem. When we tie our self worth and our happiness and our joy to this status game, then that is when it becomes a problem. Status games are incredibly addictive because we have been conditioned to associate status with worth. Status feels like a shining gold star of approval, but status is inherently a scarcity game. There's no such thing as status without a hierarchy. So to have status means that others need to have less status. They need to be less influential, less powerful. And here is the rub. Status is never secured. The other day I saw a popular celebrity. Well, it used to be a popular celebrity. Now you look at that statement. It used to be a popular celebrity. I don't want to mention her name. You know, I saw her on the media and I said, where has this lady been all along? She's no longer popular. She's, when I say popular, okay, again, that's again, it's the status thing, again, you see? She's no longer in the mainstream. I said, why? But when she was in the mainstream, she had um, millions and millions and millions of people who listened to her songs all over the world. But now she's no longer in the mainstream. Somebody else has taken that position. Now, if she had tied, I don't know if she, if she, if she does, by the way, if she had tied her self-worth to always being at the forefront, number one bestseller, number one uh, award in this uh, this in R&B category, you know, like even all those Oscar awards and stuff. <laughs> and when when she doesn't get it, the, after five years, someone, some new kid come on the block. Then what happens? If she starts her self worth to that, then she start feeling, oh man, oh man, oh man, nobody cares about me. I'm no longer relevant. Then that is when it becomes a problem. I hope I'm communicating this very well. Please, I don't want you to leave me here thinking I'm, I'm against the Oscar award or against all of this. I'm not against. Them. I'm just saying, don't tie your self worth to them. You are inherently somebody who is of worth to God. By virtue of you showing up here, you are worthy. Let me also give you a status game, even within the Christian community. Some people reach uh, wrong crusades and reach 10,000, 1 million people. It can become a status game when it becomes something that you tie yourself worth to, where it is only when you reach a million people in the world that you say, oh, you've done very well. And I kid you not, God doesn't care whether you reach a million or you reach two million or you reach 500 or you or reach one person. The love that God has for you has no bearing on how many people you read for the Lord. Or how many, or maybe you are a regional pastor managing 10,000 pastors. It doesn't matter anything to God. That is something that you guys have created and built up. To God, it doesn't matter. You are first and foremost a child of God. And all of us are children of God. And whether you have, whether you led one person to Jesus or you never led anybody to Jesus, you are still a child of God and God loves you. I am not saying don't lead people to Christ. I am saying let, it, let us not buy into the status game where we are trying to do one over the other person because we feel unless I do this and do this, I have not arrived. You already arrived the day you were born. You already arrived the day you became a Christian. You already arrived the day you showed up here. Your presence on this earth gave you the credence, the ability, the qualification to say, I am worth it. Praise God. Status is never secured. Because if you tie yourself well to it, you can lose it at any time. If you marry the most eligible bachelor in town, 
this guy takes all the money, gambles it away, and you, you lost all your money. You've lost it us. You're no longer in that category that they have created. Somebody can always come the next day and because become the next best thing. Status is incredibly fickle. Second Corinthians chapter 10, verse 2, the Bible says, Of course, we wouldn't dare to put ourselves in the same class or compare ourselves with those who rate themselves so highly. They compare themselves to one another and make up their own standards to measure themselves by. And then they judge themselves by their own standards. What self-delusion? You know what this is saying? He says, somebody sat down and said, okay, we're going to have, we're going to create a standard whereby we measure people that are the best in, in this area, this is the category. So we're going to set up a board. We're going to call it the overachievers board. Okay? And we're going to put these parameters there. And the person who gets to be, who, who qualifies with these categories will be the person that we say is the best person in this place and blah, blah, blah. And the challenge that I presents is you wrote the exams. You marked the exams. You presented the certificates to your own self. That's why the Bible says it is self-delusion. As this happened before, and what can we learn from it? As What can we learn from Jesus about the status game? We've seen what happened to Adam. Our Adam lost the entire garden because he was trying to grab the God status, which he already had by identity. Again, I want to say, if you're a child of God, and God has declared over you anything in the Bible that he has declared you to be, if you don't believe it, and you're trying to work to have it, you have just acted like, like Adam, and you are going to lose the garden. You will not have joy in your work with God. Working with God will be like um, like a bizarre experience, you know. Like you're thinking, what's going on here? There's no joy. There's no happiness. You feel like a burden. Matthew chapter three, verse three, thirteen to seventeen. This was Jesus coming to be baptized. I want you to understand what is about to happen here. Over the next thirteen minutes, I wanted to unravel for you what God taught me. You see, Matthew three, thirteen to seventeen began the story about jesus when he began his public ministry he had been he had been born for about 30 years here but he hadn't done miracle he hadn't done nothing he had not performed one single miracle when we when this scene showed up the bible said then jesus christ came from galilee to the jordan to be baptized by john but john tried to deter him saying i need to be baptized by you and you come to me Jesus Christ replied, Let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. Now, as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he, Jesus, saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And then a voice from heaven said, This is my Son. Whom I love, with him I am well pleased. In the KJV it is rendered, This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. The Bible says, The voice of God the Father spoke over Jesus, This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Now, let's unpack this statement that God the Father made over Jesus. There are two phrases I want to focus on. The first one is, beloved son this other one is well pleased this is my beloved son the word beloved son is from the word agapetos agapetos means esteemed dear favorite or beloved now the, the phrase well pleased is from the greek word eudokio eudokio means to think well of to be well pleased so you can say god was saying to jesus we combine this together that this is my esteemed son or my beloved son or my darling son in whom i think well of i am always thinking well of this one that's what god is saying now by this statement God def- conferred the status of all statuses on Jesus. And what is that status? My beloved son. My beloved son. 
the greatest status you can ever have in this world is to be called a child of God. I'm a child of God. I'm a child of God. I'm a child of God. God publicly, de- publicly declared by Jesus the esteemed status of what? You are ch- this is my child. The greatest appellation, the greatest uh, uh, status that God can, can, can confer on you is to call you my beloved child. Now, I want you to hold that thought because I'm coming back there later. My beloved child, the highest appellation, highest status that God can confer on you is what? My beloved child. You are my beloved child. There is this, I am well pleased. I'm always thinking well about you. Now, after this was said to Jesus, the Bible said that Jesus Christ was now sent to the wilderness to be tempted, just like Adam and Eve were tempted. In the beginning, the Bible says in Matthew chapter 4, then Jesus Christ was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to be to become bread. So you see, the first statement that the tempter came is to challenge that sonship, that God conferred status, my beloved child. The temptations that we are going to see in this text in Matthew chapter 4 were engineered to challenge that status, that status of all statuses, my beloved child. If you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus Christ answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God, that our existence should be based on what God has said. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him to stand on the highest point of the temple verse 6 if you are the son of God again that phrase again if you are the son of God throw yourself down for it is written he will command his angels concerning you and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone what did Jesus Christ do it is also written do not put the Lord your God to the test now you see a pattern here every time the devil comes up with a temptation he is saying if you truly are a child of God, prove your sonship by acting this way and acting that way against the will of God. Become reckless. Do whatever you want to do. Use your power in any way. If you are truly a child of God, if it's true that he has declared over you, this my this my beloved son, the woman, well please. If you truly are that son of God, I said, then act this way to prove that you're a son of God. If you're a son of God, you believe that you're a child of God. Why do you have to prove anything? You don't have to prove anything to anybody. It's like your child. Somebody says to my daughter, and I say, if you're Kenny's daughter, if you're David's daughter, prove, prove this body. She doesn't have to do anything like that. And doing anything doesn't prove otherwise. She's already my child. I hope you understand what I'm saying. So the first two temptations of Jesus was, were directed against sonship, against this identity, against the status that God has conferred on him. Now, Look at what the devil then did. When he realized that this is not working, he was just keep use, kept using the word to counter this, this thought process. Verse 8. The devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdom of the world and their splendor. Stop. He showed him all of the kingdoms of the world. I want you to understand what he said. He showed him not just the kingdom of what Christ can see then. He showed him kingdoms and, like United Kingdom, United States. This kingdom that have not even yet shown up. He showed the kingdoms of all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor, the glory. When we chase status, is that not what we're looking for? The glory. I am the best dog. I'm the best man here. Everybody's calling my name. Is that not what we're looking for? That's what the devil then said. Okay, since this guy is not going to fall for this identity stuff, he's so solid on his identity, he's not going to budge. Let us present him something else that every human being run after. The splendor. The kingdoms of this world and the splendor. The allure of the world. Be on the on the paper and Forbes list. Be on Success Magazine. Be on all of these things. Let us just do that. Give the splendor. Surely, he's going to fall for that. Verse 9, he said, all this I will give to you, he said, if you bow down and worship me. Now, worship me, the word worship me is from the Greek word that means to bow down, to make obeisance, or to kiss, to kiss the ring. Can you imagine the effrontery of of the devil? That Jesus should, should bow down to him 
Worship doesn't just mean we're lifting up holy hands. Worship is also an attitude of mind that defers to somebody else because the person, somebody's view is, is higher than ours. When you, when you choose to uh, embrace the mindset of the world and believe the mindset of the world above the mindset of God, you have begun to worship the world. You have placed the viewpoint of the world. Now, you see the word glory here. No, the, the, word, the, the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. The word glory is it's not just, just about, it's from the Greek word doxa. It's not just about um, splendor and radiance. It's also about viewpoint. So, in verse 8, just, uh, the devil is saying, he showed Jesus the kingdoms of the world and their viewpoint. And also their allure, the splendor, but also their viewpoint. And he said, I will give this to you if you worship me. Worship is talking about obeisance. Embrace the mindset of the world system. If you embrace the mindset of this world system, then I will give them to you. Every time we choose to obey the allure of the world system, we, we place ourselves we reduce our standing in God. We put ourselves under because we have chosen to look at the world through the world, through the world view of the world system. Jesus Christ said to him, Away from me, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and the and angels came and attended to him. So the first two temptations, I have to stop here because I think I'm, I, I ran out of time. The first two temptations here was a challenge against Jesus' identity, but the third was an appeal to worldly status. The replies of Jesus gave us hint as to how do we handle the temptation when it shows up. You cannot live on this life, in this planet, and not be tempted by status. You cannot live on this life, in this life, and not be tempted by status. It might not be in the world, it might even be in the church. What do you do? Jesus Christ, we can learn from him there. He spoke the word of God over the situation. But when the allure of the word came, what did he do? He gave the first status back to God. He shifted his attention and said, no, I'm not going to do that. So next week, I'm going to show you five things. Five things to do to overcome the status trap. Five things. Now remember, God is not against you succeeding. In fact, Jeremiah 29 verse 11, the Bible says, I know the thoughts that I have towards you to give you a future and unexpected end. I know the thought that I have towards you, the thought of good, not of evil, to give you a future and unexpected end. God wants you to succeed. But God does not want you to embrace the world view, the allure of the world, where you begin to defer to the world system above the viewpoint of god that's really what god doesn't want to do status in in and of itself is not evil but chasing status to the point where it defines our happiness and joy or where we think we are not worthy we are not enough because we have not we have not bought into or enter into some some clubs or some groups that men created that that is when it becomes a problem I am going to continue this next week. I will talk about the five things that God showed me on how to overcome the status trap. And the Lord will help us in the name of Jesus Christ. Like I said to you, none of us is immune to this thing. But when we embrace the fact that we have not bought into a status, we have not got into a status that humans create, what do you think happens automatically? You start to feel like you are not enough. You start to feel like you are... You, what, where, have, where, where have I been all my life? When, when you begin to judge yourself based on the... on the... on the... Um, on, the uh, on the ideal that humans created and you find yourself to come to fall short, you, you start to run around in life like you have not done enough like your life is a waste then it becomes a, a life of pressure right but that pressure you put on yourself what should you chase instead chase your purpose 
Chase your destiny. Live your life. I'm going to show you some five things next week that God taught me. This is how to avoid the status trap, right? So that we can focus more on who God has already declared us to be. Remember, Satan gave three temptations. Two of those were to attack his identity. The last one was to parlay the glory of the world before Jesus, thinking he was going to fall, just like Adam fell the, the last time. Because the Bible says of, of the woman, the Bible says the woman was convinced. Why? Because she because she saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious and she wanted the wisdom it would give her. The system of the world may look delicious. The system of Oh, you are not this, you are not that. May look like, oh man, there's a wisdom there. That's why the woman was convinced. But it only leads to scarcity. When we don't embrace the fact that we are already uh, surrounded by abundance, by the virtue of the Father who showed up on this earth, by virtue of the Father inside of us is living the abundance of God. When we don't believe this truth, automatically we shift our mindset to scarcity. And that's not what God wants for you. So, as we leave, I want us to live with this mindset that you have already been made prosperous by God, by the fact that you are a human being. You have a crown on your head, on your head, the crown of glory on your head. God has crowned you with glory and honor. Just believe it. Believe it. Walk from this abundance. Don't walk to it. Walk from it because that's already who you are. Embrace that mindset so that you don't buy into the mindset, I'm not good enough, I'm not fine enough, I'm not smart enough, I'm not this, I'm not that, I'm not that. Who made up these rules? They are rules that human beings make up. Don't get sucked up into the status trap. God bless you. By next week, I will expand, expand more on the five um, ways in which you can avoid the trap. Alright, now before we go, I want to say a reminder to you that next week, Saturday, we have the Glory and Honor Conference. Please do register for the conference. We are going to be talking more about the glory and the honor that God has already placed upon you so that you don't start becoming somebody who is chasing shadows. You don't want to become somebody who is just chasing to become, to become something. If you don't believe you're a son of God, you start doing stuff to become son of God. If you don't believe that God has accepted you, you start doing stuff to make God to accept you. But God already accepted you in Jesus. So, please join us uh, next uh, Saturday. We're going to start at 10.30 in the morning. I'll finish at 1.30 in the afternoon, UK time. Uh, we're going to talk about, you know, a few things that God has already declared you to be, alright, based on what his, what his word says. And then from there, we'll take it from there. Please, Come around. We're going to be giving some of the books. I've got some of the books at the back there. I'm going to be giving some of them away. You know, for we're going to run some challenge during the conference. So, flick, uh, some of you can win, and then we'll take it from there. Please, also, I want to rec- encourage you to come to midweek Bible service. This midweek service, I have been talking a lot about um, about the fact that there's a mindset that we must have. You no, know, there's a mastery that we must master this last week i spoke about language about the fact that there are conversations we have in our heart you know that can um, wire destructiveness into us you know and we went through certain examples in the bible class make sure you join if you don't if you can't join go back to the youtube channel you see the replay there all right until next time please remember you are blessed already blessed and highly favored father i pray for your children i pray almighty god that you help us as we go thank you almighty god for your mercies and grace and goodness thank you for the ways in which you have helped us today let this mercy almighty god enter into our heart help us to ponder these words and help us almighty god, to act help us almighty god not to chase status in the name of Jesus Christ, but to chase you instead thank you heavenly father in jesus name we pray if you have never given your life to jesus and you are thinking hey man I want to give my life to Jesus. I think my life is not going the direction which I've, uh, it has been going. I've chased status all my life. Now I realize that I'm already enough in Christ. You know, I just want to be in this Christ. I want to give my life to Jesus Christ. I want to pray with you. It is very simple indeed. You just need to believe in your heart that Christ died for you. That he came to the world to pay for the sins of this world. He died for you and he died as you. On the third day, the Bible said God raised him from the dead. Now Christ is seated at the right hand of God, is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And now the Bible said that anyone who put their trust in the sacrifice of Christ, that God declared them righteous. God declared them that they are as they ought to be. So, and if you want to give your life to Jesus, you just have to believe that in your heart. 
and confess that with your mouth. Say with me, dear Lord Jesus, thank you for dying in my place. Thank you for paying for my sin. I receive you now as my Lord and as my Savior. Thank you for having me. I yield my life to you. Thank you. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. If you have said that with your mouth and believe that in your heart, the Bible says you are now a child of God. I will see you soon. Now, if you need to get some um, documents to build you up, please write to the church, light at the lighthouse.org. We're going to send you an ebook called The Court of Sonship. It will tell you about who you are and how God desires for you to be like Christ and how to go about them. God bless you. I will speak to you next time. Thank you for coming today. We believe that you have been blessed. To watch the replay of this service, please go to our YouTube channel at the Lighthouse Church. We also have a video vault of all our services on our website at www.thelighthouse.org. We hope to see you again on Sunday at 8 a.m. UK time, on Wednesday at 6 p.m. UK time for our Bible Hangout, and on Saturday at 6 a.m. UK time for prayers. We hope you enjoy your week. Until next time, God bless you.